In this video, we're going to look at uh, economic growth. So we're going to talk about the sources of economic growth and some ideas behind why some economies grow, why some don't, um, and we want to look at uh, what's going on there. So the best place to start would be to look at a graph of per capita GDP. I'll zoom in here. So here's a graph of per capita GDP uh, for the U.S. since 1930. So this is U.S. real per capita, or it's a measure of income per person over, over each year. And what we can see is that since 1930, income has gone from, well, around 1930, we're looking at around $5,000, and it's grown continuously until... 2012, and we're at about $36,000 right now. So over that time frame, real income per person has increased approximately sevenfold. Okay, uh, when we're looking at growth, as we'll find out in a minute, uh, this is actually not linear; it's curved upwards. So what we want to do is we want to take that and we want to make it more of a line. And to do that. What we tend to do is we tend to look at the natural log of, it, of per capita GDP. So I'm going to log the scale. And then here what we have is a logarithmic scale. So for smaller distances, a big jump indicates big jumps. But as we move up and up, a bigger jump indicates uh, an even larger jump. So we're looking at a percentage term here. And what we see is that if we log real per capita GDP in the U.S., we get this nice line that's going upwards. And again, it's telling us the same story. In 1940, per capita income was $8,000. In 2012, it was about $36,000. So over that time frame, since 1940 to 2000, we'll call it 2010, so that's 70 years per capita income has increased four and a half fold. Okay, so overall, income in the U.S. has grown tremendously. Um, and we're looking at per capita terms, so this is taking out the effects of population growth. And we're looking at real GDP, so it's taking into account inflation as well. So overall, we have a much higher standard of living today than we did in 1940 and in 1930 and uh, any time before this. So we want to understand what are some of the sources for economic growth. And to do that, we, we need to actually understand uh, what is growth. So, and when we're thinking about economic growth, we need to be thinking uh, so what is it? So fundamentally, we're just looking at the percentage change in income per person. Okay, so our measure of growth is going to be the percentage change in real GDP. I'll just put Y divided by the population. So real GDP per capita. So when we're thinking about this, we can use our percentage change formula. And this is one of the fascinating things about growth is why it's not linear, it's compounding. So Albert Einstein said compounding growth was one of the best inventions by man or the most amazing thing. So when we think about population growth, if we know we're, we're starting out today, we can figure out where we're going to be next year. And then if we know where we are next year, if we know the growth rate, we can figure out where we're going to be in two years, and then three years, and four years, and so forth. Okay, so for example, let's just use a savings account. Okay, so suppose that your grandfather gives you $100 today, and you put it into a savings account that pays, we'll call it 2% interest. Okay, so today, 
that you have $100. Okay? And the interest rate equals 2% per year. So we need to know how much are we going to have in one year? Well, it's pretty easy. I think most people would say, well, $100 at 2% interest, we're going to have $102. Okay? Or what that means is we'll call this, this is our principal, so we'll call this P0. How much we have in our account is P0. That's today. P1 will be one year from now. P2 will be two years from now, so forth. Okay? Well, P1 is going to be equal to what we have today, so that's P0, times 1 plus our interest rate. So we have 1 plus 0 0.02, which is 1.02 times 100, gets us to $102. Okay, so in one year from now, we'll have $102. If we let that sit for another year, we'll have P2, which is going to be equal to our P1 times 1 plus I. But remember, P1 is just P0 times 1 plus I. So P2 is actually going to be, can be rewritten as P0 times 1 plus I times 1 plus I. Or that equals P0 times 1 plus I squared. Okay? Then if we let that sit for another year, P2 will gain interest and turn into P3. So P3 is going to be equal to P2 times 1 plus I. But remember, we said P2 is P0 times 1 plus I squared. So that's going to be equal to P0 times 1 plus I squared times 1 plus I, which is going to be equal to P0 times 1 plus I cubed. So what we mean by compounded growth is that interest gains interest on itself. So we have this exp exponent going on with our interest rate because interest gains on itself. So we gain $2 of interest the first year. The second year, we gain interest on that $2 of interest. So we just don't gain $2 per year. We gain 2% per year. So we gain $2 plus 2% interest on the interest. And that's what we get with compounding. So if we look far, far, far in the future, we can look at interest really far in the future. So using this notation, if we go P, J, so however many years, J years out from now, is going to be equal to what we have today, so P0, times 1 plus I to the J power. Okay, and this is what we mean by growth and, and why it's so fascinating. So if we're looking out, let's say we call it 100 years. So you have $100 in a new account that pays 2% interest, and you hold on to it for 100 years. Well, how much are you going to have? So if J equals 100, P100 is going to be equal to 100, P0, times 1 plus 0 0.02 to the 100th power. And let me do the calculation. So we have 1.02 to the 100th times 100. So P100, after 100 years, you are going to have 724.46. So if you hold on for 100 years, your $100 will turn into $724.46. OK? 
Okay, so overall, compounding growth leads to big differences over time. So even small differences in growth rates can lead to big differences. And to give an example, suppose that your grandmother says, I want to put you into a savings account that pays you 3% interest per year. Well, if you're holding on for one year, your $100, your $100 turns into $102 at 2% interest or $103 at 3% interest. So over one year, it's a dollar difference. But what happens if you held on to that for 100 years? So now let's suppose in our alternate universe, your grandmother put it in at 3% interest instead of 2% interest. In that case, you would have 1.03, so 1 plus 3.03 .03, to the 100th power times our initial $100. So if she put it in that paid instead of 0 0.02, it's going to pay 0 0.03. We'll say I prime equals 3% per annum. So just a small difference, 0 0.01 difference, OK? Instead of $724.46 in a 3% interest rate account, we'll call it P100 prime. So now we're paying 3% interest instead. Your $100 would have now be worth $1,921.86. So approximately just shy of three times what it would pay if we paid 2% interest. So over long periods, so over long stretches, because of compounding, small differences in economic growth can lead to large changes. So if we're thinking in per capita terms or per capita income terms, we'd much rather grow at 3% as compared to 2% because look at the small difference. Okay, so well, a small difference here leads to a big difference 100 years from now. Okay, or to put it another way, Suppose that we have two economies which are similar today. So we have one economy, or two economies. Each one starts out at $100 per capita income today. 100 years from now, if economy A grows at 2% and economy B grows at 3% per year, in 100 years, economy A will be at $724.46 per capita income. So they'll have gained sevenfold. Economy B, however, by growing 1% faster per year, will be 19 times better off than they were 100 year, or than they were today. So these small differences in growth can lead to big changes over time. Okay, so a natural question is with this compounding is we want to get a sense of how long is long. Okay, and one way to do that is we think of it as what we consider like a half-life, but the opposite of that or the inverse of that. So we think of how, how long would it take for one economy to double its per capita income. So if we're starting at $100, approximately how long will it take for an economy to get to $200 per capita income? Or if they start at $200, how long will it take for them to get to $400 per capita income? So we want to know how long approximately does it take to double your GDP per capita. And we can do this using the rule of 70. Okay, so the rule of 70 says that the time to double your GDP per capita, real GDP per capita, is approximately equal to 70 divided by the growth rate. And this is as a percentage. Okay, 
So here, if we had our economy growing at 2% per year, the time to double growing at 2% per year would be approximately equal to 70 divided by 2, which is 2%, which is approximately equal to 35 years. So just over a generation, it'll take for per capita income to double. Okay. However, if the economy is growing at 3% per year, then the time to double is going to be approximately equal to 70 divided by 3. And that's, which is just over 23 years. So in this case, it'll take 23.3 years, we'll call it, to double our per capita income if we grow by 1% faster. And this is why we see to those large differences over 100 years. Because over that time frame, our economy is doubling every 23.3 years instead of every 35 years. So we see approximately a 12-year difference here in how long it takes to double our income per person. So here, just shy of a generation from now, we'd see doubled income per person. So that means that every new generation of kids is going to be more than twice as better off as the people before them or as their parents. Whereas here, it's going to take just over a generation, if we're thinking 30 years, to grow up and have another generation of, of, of children. So I'm thinking 30 years for a generation. Okay. So just the small difference between 2% and 3% lead to big differences. Okay, And one of the fascinating things is what we call the East Asian Tigers. So we have a few, uh, a few nations, typically in Southeast Asia, that have been growing tremendously for years and years and years. And I think that the newest member of this would be China. And if we think about China, China has been growing, we'll call it at 10% per year. So for China to double its income per person, it's approximately equal to 70 divided by 10, which is every seven years. So if a generation is 30 years, that means every quarter generation, or every generation is going to be eight times as better off as their parents when they were born. Okay, Because we're thinking every seven years to double its income. So that's, that's pretty decent. So you get your first job. Seven years later, you're going to be making twice that. Seven years later, so 14 years after you started your job, you're going to be making four times your original income. Okay, So that gives you some sense into how fast growth rates translate into how fast is fast, or how long does this thing take. Okay, So when we're thinking about growth, we're not thinking year over year. But these year-over-year -year differences make big differences over longer stretches. And the rule of 70 helps us wrap our head around that compounding factor. All right, the last part that I want to go over is what are the sum of the determinants of growth? So, so what are some of the determinants of growth? Okay, so why do some nations grow and some don't? And this is just a quick overview. In the next video, we'll go into much more detail about what those determinants are and how to view them appropriately. So we'll build them into an economic theory of some sort. Okay, so the first one is we're looking more at, so what makes nations grow? And the first one is going to be labor productivity. So labor productivity is how productive is our labor force, or approximately how much stuff per hour can one person make. So if one person becomes more productive, they're making more per hour. 
So of course, if we had the same amount of labor working the same amount of hours and each person is making more, that's going to lead to a higher level of GDP or a higher level of GDP per capita. Okay, so when we think about labor productivity, health factors are a big determinant of that. So if somebody is very, very sick, let's say that they have malaria, right? they're going to be very sick and ill, and they're not going to be as productive as somebody who's healthy. So when we think of what we would say is poor nations versus rich nations, we're thinking about people maybe with malnutrition and face disease versus a society with plenty to eat and has a good health system that can treat these preventable diseases. Okay. And that can help explain why some nations are poor, some nations are rich. Some have more food and better access to health uh, health care than others. And that would influence labor productivity. One of the big things today facing developing nations, or developed nations, excuse me, so rich nations, would be maybe the obesity epidemic. And economists have tried to go through and calculate how much does obesity affect labor productivity? Because it leads to lower health outcomes, and those lower health outcomes are going to mean our labor force is less productive because they're sicker more often. Okay, and, and we've gone through and tried to estimate what those decreases are. Okay, so labor productivity is a big one. The second one in here is the capital stock. So we're thinking physical capital, such as a plant, a computer, a uh, machine, some chairs and desks, okay? So obviously, let's, if we're thinking about, we're an, account, an accountant, excuse me, then if we have a computer and a nice office, we're gonna be much more productive as an accountant doing tax returns than we would be if we had no computer and we're sitting out on the street. Okay, so how much capital we have can influence how much we make. Or if we have a machine to help assist making cars, such as doing the heavy lifting, then instead of it having labor try to lift those cars, we can have a machine lift those cars and we'd be more productive. Okay, so overall, the capital stock can help economies grow. Okay, and that's why when we cover the financial system, savings equals investment, which investment is going into our capital stock. So the reason that we study the financial system is because it's a main player in what we think of as economic growth. So that financial system and all that money going in and coming out of the financial system is going in to some of these, which are going to lead to economic growth over the long run. The third one is human capital. And human capital is the knowledge and the skill set of workers. So if we think of how productive is our labor force, human capital is a player in that. So what is the skill set of our labor force? If we have a bunch of unskilled laborers, they're not going to be as productive as a bunch of skilled laborers. So human capital is how do we gain those skills? And we think of it as on-the-job training, maybe shadowing, such as uh, if we have a mentor, or we can think of it as education. Okay, so as we have better education, our members, our labor is going to be more smart, so they can solve problems better, which is going to lead to more labor productivity, which leads to more production or economic growth. Okay, and then the last one is the level of technology. And what we mean by technology is the blueprint for production. Okay, so in the early 1900s, Henry Ford invented the production line or the assembly line. So instead of having a car that was stationary and labor that was mobile, I put, I build a car, I have to take all my tools, put them back, and move all my tools over to the next car. Instead of that, 
the human sits here and we have a machine that swings around the car for me. So I put on a door and then I get ready and I have another door. And as soon as I'm ready for that, another car starts. So I can put on another door and then I put on another door. So I don't have to be doing all this moving around. Okay. So we rearrange how we're producing. Another example might be suppose that we have a bank. If we have a bank and we have some loan officers that are over here and one that's over there, and then we have bank tellers, one that's sitting really far in the back and one that's sitting right up here up front. And then we have like human resources department and they're all scattered throughout our bank. We can rearrange where those people are and probably be more productive. So we're going to take our loan officers and put them together, our bank tellers and put them together, our HR department and put it together. Okay, so overall they can communicate if they have problems because they're not spread out there in one place. So it, I don't have to necessarily change how many machines that I have or how many people that I have. I just rearrange them and I'm probably going to be more productive or have some growth factor there due to technology. Okay, so overall, these are four broad ca categories that lead to economic growth. And with that, in the next video, what we're going to look at is how do we build this into a model? So how do we take these productivity factors and how, how do we think about them appropriately?